Welcome to the official Bleed Caven podcast. I'm the Birdman, and today we have the Rogue Trader with us. He's howdy, been... howdy. We're we're here to ask you about how you got into this stuff. You know, the nitty gritty stuff. <laughs> the the nitty gritty stuff. Oh yeah. So how did you get started with comics? Well, I I got started. I was always an avid reader as, as a young child. Uh, it had to have been spring, summer. Uh, I was only about seven or eight years old. And my I was at my grandmother's house in Corinth, it's a very small town, northern Utah. And they had a small general store there. And I was driving her nuts. She was trying to do something in the garden. And, and finally, she got fed up and walked me down to the store. And there was, you know, I think, I think the intent was to buy me some candy. But we got down to the store, and there was a, a spinner rack. And we all know... The magic of the spinner rack mm-hmm. it had back in those days you could get three marvel comic books in a in a bag in a poly bag for like a dollar uh the i still have the first three books and and they're three marvel tales books they're probably total value if they were in pristine main condition probably still be a dollar but these <laughs> are the first three comic books i ever got and and that got that had me hooked. I mean, of course, as a young boy, Spider-Man, Peter Parker, that that was me, you know, wanting to be the hero. So of course. Who didn't um, want to be? So from that day forward, I was I was avid comic book reader. Um, through high school, it, it was even to the point where I had convinced my English teacher at the time to allow me to do book reports on comic books instead of regular books. I had convinced him that they were literature, right? So, yeah. um, and, and we made a deal where, I can't remember what it was, it's like every five pages of a comic book would count as one page of a regular book or something like that. So, so I didn't even have to stop to read regular books. No. I, just, I just read comic books all the way through. And um, I mean, I'd occasionally throw in the classics. Right? I'm a huge fan of, classic hero literature the three musketeers probably the greatest book in my opinion that's ever been written all the d'artagnan um, romance novels I've, I've read all those uh just the the stories of heroes right have always resonated with me and, and stuck with me so read comic books all the way through high school i joined the army when i was 16 and there's a huge history behind comic books in the military we always had comic books around and I, I was uh, with the first air cavalry. And when we were stationed overseas, we actually, I had a, a bunch of books sent to me and we passed them around. They got beat up. And I have a, a couple of the books that my unit had in Afghanistan that have stuck with me and are torn pages and folded over and beat up. And mm, cool. those things mean a lot to me as well. When I joined the service, I joined the, the reserves. So when I got out, I was actually a civilian and would go on the weekends and stuff like that to do my military stuff. And I opened a store in Ogden, and this was um, 89, 1989. I, I had a comic book store in Ogden, and I ran that for a few years before deploying again, and I had to shut it down. At, at that point... I had decided I was done with comic books, actually went 20 to 25 years, a a very, very long time um, without ever picking up a comic book. Uh, Recently, um, we we decided to slow down, kind of semi-retired and moved back to Utah. And at that point, I had remembered my comic book stores from when I was here before. So I, I looked them up and one was still open. So I went there and I picked up a couple books. And that was about two years ago. And it went from three long boxes. I don't know if you can see all the stuff behind me. Oh, I can. And it is impressive nonetheless. (laughs) I got comic books all over the place. And I was going to start open a store, but decided I like my weekends. So I I decided against that. Then decided on the web store. So I got I I have the web store and I, I sell hot and popular books and stuff like that. But I'm also I have a degree in art history and my focus, my, my major degree is anthropology. I have a minor in art history with a focus on archival science. So 
I restore historical documents. Cool. Very cool. I've got like a, a 18th century Three Musketeers as the pride of my the enjoy of my collection. I, I went from books like that to comic books, and I do minor restorative work on comic books and, and prepare them to be graded and archived and stuff like that, which led me to meet Greg at Black Cat. And I do pressing and cleaning on comic books and things like that. I was in his store, and this was probably uh, three, four months ago, when I saw the the Bleak Haven, the Bleak Haven book. And I was like, wow, that's pretty cool. Local kids, and I'll I'll toss them five bucks, sure. And and so I bought the book and took it home and read it. Being a connoisseur of comics, and especially in the, in the early 90s, late 80s, early 90s, you grew up with artists like Todd McFarlane and Jim Lee and sure. Lytha and, and those guys and, and writers that are at the top of their game. The, the art of putting together a book like this, and, and I've seen a lot of small local comics, the art of putting together a book like this is really it's not an easy thing to do and they've done such a good job with it that it frustrated me that it's so hard for that level of talent to break into this industry so that led us on a path of going from restoring and working on comic books and selling comic books to now looking into the publishing end to see if we can help these young artists get up get on their feet and and make a career out of it um, and we've got such a vast comic book community in Utah that I, we're really hoping that we can get it to take off and, and get the recognition to these young artists and, and the incredible talent that we have here uh, in Utah. Brilliant. I mean, I, th that's really what drew me to it as well. I didn't find out about it till about a year or two ago. And after I had read some of the stories before he had come out with the comic book I was really intrigued and I was like I can't wait to see this as a comic book and then when I finally got to hold that comic book in my hand it was just I, I loved it especially the fact that it was a flip book as well oh yeah it's like the uh so back in the early 90s they had a series Marvel did Marvel Comics Presents mm -hmm. and it was a flip book as well and that's what I thought was really cool about this is so back then you would read, it was a Wolverine story for the first half of the book. And then you'd flip it over and they would rotate it. It was more of an anthology. They did Ghost Rider for a while and there was the Doctor Strange thing in there and whatnot. But that whole flip book, the way that they did it and the way that I'm seeing the, the creative team of Bleak Haven do it is using that as, as a tool to kind of serialize it. Yeah which is something that, you know, you, you have all these major stories. You, you go one of two ways in comics nowadays. You either have a major storyline, like a major event like Death Metal or King in Black or something along those lines that's massive and takes up an entire company's catalog, right? Sure. So right now, King in Black, number one selling comic book crossover, and it every single title that Marvel puts out has a tie-in to King and Black. So those writers that are on, let, let's say the, the writers that are on, um, what's the one that, oh, the Black Widow. Yeah. So that writer has to stop what they're doing, kind of decide how to fit the King and Black storyline into what he's trying to tell as a story. And, and I think it loses something in translation. So you've either got that or you've got a total anthology where every single issue stands alone. And there's a lot of that in independent books right now. What I like about what the Bleak Haven guys are doing is you've got the, the feeling of an anthology because you got two stories in, per book and there's a lot going on in the city, but they don't need one part of the story to tell the other. Yeah. So they're, they're completely independent and you get the... the the flavor that this is a well thought out world, a world which anything really can happen and you don't know the next characters that's gonna come on the scene that's gonna affect a story on the flip side for issues down. So I, that, that really intrigued me about the concept. 
uh, speaking of Bleak Haven, uh, what's your favorite or who's your favorite character from Bleak Haven so far? A soft leash. Uh, that's a good character. Like he's a brute, man. Like I, I, I can't wait to see what's coming up. I, I like the darker characters. Yeah. Um, you know, the the wife and I are drudging through 15 seasons of Supernatural right now. And <laughs> and uh, that Crowley type that you, you know he's a bad guy, but he's so fun to watch his wheels turn, you know? Yeah, exactly. That that's what you get from that character. He's just because he's not, you know, you know he's part of the the cult. The cult wants him to do. He's he's got his own agenda, and, and he's working those angles. And I really dig that in a character. I I I can't blame you. I I I really enjoyed like when I when I first heard of Memphis Dophilies, I uh, I was really intrigued by the character because there's so many doors you could play through that character. You know, it just his personality is just hilarious in my opinion. I just like that kind of character there's another one so there there's an audio um a, an audio thing on the youtube channel you've only got only got two things published to the youtube channel right now and i've watched them both but one of them is i don't know about a 15 20 minute long kind of noir-ish um audio thing that i listened to one day when i was working and there's a sheriff i'm not sure if it's sheriff or just an officer in in the city of bleak haven but yeah. that character it, it yeah it's this whole story about an officer just reading a journal i like listening to audio dramas so i look forward to more of those from what i know we we are working on trying to put out more that yeah, and perfect. That's, that's a great thing to listen to while i'm sitting here working on comic books and stuff it's it's awesome i found out about audio dramas like a while ago i think the first audio drama i ever listened to was like george lucas's like star wars and that was the audio drama and it was really great because i had mark hamill voice and stuff like that but I'm, I'm looking forward to it i think it's like the tales of daniel blake or something like that and it's just gonna be more journal entries of like all of these random crazy stories where superheroes meet villains or monsters or you know, because that's the greatest part about Bleak Haven is that it's like you said, it's an anthology. You don't know what's going to happen next. Right. Let's rewind. How did you uh, how did you come up with the, the name Rogue Trader? Um, well, back when I had my store uh, in, the, in the 80s and early 90s, um, there's a tabletop war game. Uh, it's called Warhammer 40K. Um, I know a lot of people that will listen to this so may be familiar with it. And it's about all of your fantasy races, the elves and humans and orcs and dwarves and all that, but set in the 41st millennia. So they're in space and they got jump packs and armor and they're shooting bolter rifles and all this. The very first incarnation of that game was actually called the Rogue Trader. And it was about basically pirate marines that had left the empire and went out on their own and done their own thing and my my original name for my store was really lame so i'm not even going to mention it but i bought out another store and when i moved into that other store they're really big in into this 40k thing and i didn't know much about it and they had the book the the game book the rogue trader there and i just i picked it up i'm like oh that's that's pretty cool that's I picked up the name and I, I ran with it. And that was the name of my store for quite a long time. And when I decided to go back into business and get a business license and become a business again, one of my, I was looking for a name and I had originally wanted to call it fanboys with a Z. Yeah. And my wife kept telling me that's stupid. I'm like, no, that's really super cool. You just don't get it. <laughs> and she's right. It's stupid. So <laughs> I, I have a group with all of my friends that we've been gamers and comic book lovers and we we've known each other for all of our lives and i threw it out to them and i'm like what what would be a good name and my best friend um gil he's like well what's wrong with the rogue trader you've always been the rogue trader so i looked it up and it was available so i just grabbed it and the the evolution of the character that you see now and and i look at the rogue trader as a character 
and and we're hoping to do something with a comic book in the future, some games and stuff like that. But I I ran into this young lady. She's a comic book artist. Um, her name's Yasmin Tatiana. She's she lives in California. She's from Utah, and Gil again referred her to me because she was the queen of the Utah Winter Fair for like five or six years. So she's been around and she's an extremely talented artist. And I commissioned her to help me create this Rogue Trader character. And if you look at the the character that we've come up with, it's, it's a lot more medieval. Mm. Uh, it's medieval, but it's still kind of timeless. And, and the gear that he carries what ended up being like, You've got a Thundercat sword, a Tartarus um, lamp, the the gravity boots from Back to the Future. Like all these little things are, are hanging about his person. So it kind of lends to that idea that, that this character is a traitor in the strange, the bizarre, and the fantastical. And that just kind of really resonated with me. And so the rogue trader now went from that futuristic sci-fi um, war game to, to meaning this this like keeper of fantasy and keeper of war that, that's going to explore the world and, and give you the best parts of basically of your dreams. So that, that's kind of where I come up with the, how I evolved into this rogue trader that I think of now. Wow, that's a really that's really cool. That's a whole lot better story than how I got the name Birdman. For sure. <laughs> wow, no, that is that is very cool. Um, you you also said when you were talking about uh that you you worked with books and and stuff like that. Um, you mentioned grading. Could you tell right. us about your comic grading process? Uh, well, I don't grade books. I mean, I can't. It, grading is completely subjective with comic books, right? It used to be um, back when I, and it, I had to make this adjustment because back when I originally was doing comics for 80 years, the grading system was poor, fine, very fine, near mint, mint, pristine mint. And it was kind of a, a an abbreviated system. So NM was near mint, MT was mint, M or PM was pristine mint. And the higher the grade goes, the more valuable the book is because people want their books to be in top condition. Sure. Then a couple companies came along and decided they were going to grade books and then seal them in plastic. They came from a baseball card background and in baseball cards and, and money, uh, coins and, and paper money, they grade on a different scale. They grade on a scale from one to 10. So the new company decided they were going to start grading on a scale from one to 10. And that just kind of caught the reason behind it. And it, it has a lot to do with the internet and internet sales. Um, but the reason they do it is because if I go on eBay and buy a book that has not been graded professionally by a third party, I have to trust the person on the other end as to what they tell me the condition of that book is. I know when I list a book, I list it. If I list a book as raw and I'm selling it online, I can say it's raw, but in my opinion, it's going to grade out to be this. Still, that means relatively little to the person buying it because they don't know. Yeah. So the way, the way that these grading companies work is you send them the book, they look it over, they give it a grade from one to 10, and then they seal it in a tamper-proof plastic case. And that preserves it and keeps it and there's other things that go into it. There's there's comic extenders and chemical alterations. There, there's a lot that goes into it. But basically what you get back is that book with a number on it, graded one to 10. And now when I put it on eBay or sell it on Facebook and I say, this book is a 9.8, that's not me saying it's 9.8. That's a professional grading company that says it's 9.8. I and, and so it assigns a real value to it. And by doing that, your your book that normally you would have sold for $20, now you've got a guaranteed grade of 9.8. It might be worth 250 be, because there's nobody that can say, no, it's not a 9.8, because it is. It says right there, 
And it wasn't me that did it. It was somebody in Florida that decided that that's what that was. It's yeah. actually three guys in Florida look at it and, and come to a consensus on the grade of the book. So that's in a nutshell how grading works. And it can be a little more complicated than that, but that's basically it. And what I do is people from all over the country send me their books and I, I look at them if they ha have dirt on them that I can clean off and stuff like that. I clean it and there's a lot of techniques that go into that. So I dry clean the books and then I press them, flatten them out, get wrinkles out, get spine ticks out, do the best I can to make it as look as nice as possible so that they can then take that book, send it to these third party graders and have it graded as, as high as possible. Oh, that's a really cool process. I've, I've, I've always wondered about the grading process. That's wow. Yeah. The, the grading process itself is, is rather complicated because they actually have three people grade it, three separate people at separate times in separate rooms, look at it and independently come up with a grade and make notes on it. And then a fourth person takes that information gathers it all together, averages it out, and then discusses it with the other three if he needs to, and that's how they assign a grade to it. Oh, wow. Seems pretty substandard now that you think about it, but I mean, that's that's really cool, yeah. So I've always just seen grades and stuff like, I don't know, I've never gone on eBay and like looked particularly towards uh, books, but I've only seen grades in like stores and stuff like that, and I always just wondered how it was, how they got graded. Now, one thing that I do, I personally, and, and this is just personal preference, mm -hmm. I don't have graded books in my collection. I collect low grade reading copies of everything I have. So I've got a complete run of every Conan the Barbarian comic book printed by Marvel. And every one of those books from the 70s and 80s, they got dog ears, they got color breaks on them. Some of them have ripped pages and, and stuff like that. So that's the kind of book I collect. For one thing, it's a lot cheaper that way. But I, I like reading them. And I will occasionally dip into the short boxes, pull out five or six books in a run and read them just to remember these stories. So that's my preference. I don't do graded books. For my extremely valuable ones, for example, I've got a Amazing Fantasy 15. Um, this is the first comic book that Spider-Man was ever in. Amazing Fantasy 15. Very cool. I used to work part-time as a travel agent, and I put together a comic book convention on a cruise ship. And I did this because I'm very self-serving, and I knew if I gave Stan Lee a free cruise for him and his wife, that he would sit at my dinner table every single night, and I, I would have Stan Lee's attention. So... I put together this this cruise and I was able to have Stanley sign yeah. my Amazing Fantasy 15. It's missing half of a cover. Um, it's beat up and it's not graded. If it were to be graded, it would grade out at about 2.5 at the very, very best. So, I mean, still worth a substantial amount of money. Sure. Uh, and just timeless in itself because, I mean, you got to get it signed by Stan Lee, you know, it's... I don't know, for me, I, I, that's how I've always pictured uh, having my comic book sign. Like, it, it's more of an experience for me. Like, I got to go up and have that signed by that, by, you know, by the creator. For me, that, that resonates more to me than really about what condition the book is. Right. You know, and all the signatures, I don't have somebody's name on my comic books. I, I, I don't do that. It doesn't make sense to me. So all my signatures in my personal collection are books that the comic artist or creator wrote to Eric. And then, so it's got my name on there. So they wrote it to me in front of me. Because uh, to me, for my personal collection, it wouldn't make sense to do it any other way. No, I'm, I'm, that, that's understanding. I mean, it's supposed to be, for me, it's always been more of like that, that personal touch, you know, like, for every time I ever look at mine, it's more of that memory of being able to say that I went up and I, I, I got that signed. I've already experienced the joy that the book gave to me, but having it signed and going over there and having it signed by its creator really makes me, it, it just 
brings up the memory of a getting sight and actually getting to meet that person. Well, I think it's it's a sign of respect to those creators as well. Sure. Right. Because when I when I get a book signed and it's to me personally, they know I'm not selling it. Yeah. So they know that I respect what they've done so much that I want to market in a way that it's worthless to anyone else. Yeah. But it means the world to me. That that's kind of my way of looking at at signatures. Could you tell us a little bit more about your online store, the the Rogue Trader? Well, the the online store, I, I basically just came up with it as a way to move product. I, I got my business license, and very first thing I did was I went out and bought a 1976 Winnebago. Nice. And we were going to gut the thing out, turn it into a mobile comic book store, so I could go to cities that don't have comic book stores. Oh wow. Yeah. And I can go to those schools and, and interact with the kids. I've got thousands and thousands of books that have been donated to me so I can give them back to these kids. I just give them comic books so they can read and enjoy them. It was shortly after that, uh, when we started working on that, that um, the whole COVID thing happened. So now that, that's out of the, out of the question. And I was selling online and I'm like, well, I might as well just build a website. So I built the website. I originally had gotten the website because I, I wanted to focus on my charity work. Sure. Um, I'm, I'm at a point in my life where what I do, I, I have that component of giving back. I, I'm financially okay. My wife makes a lot of money. So I don't have to go get a job. I can survive on this. And I wanted to give back. So we, we donate money back to the American Cancer Society. And what we're working with, Lee Haven, that's coming up this weekend, the, the proceeds from that are going to the Hope Lodge for the American Cancer Society. And as a veteran, I also work with Honor 365 that, that helps first responders and vets. That was the original reason for the website. So I could focus on that. When I started pressing professionally about a year ago, one of my good friends uh, that lives in, in Washington was like, well, do you have a website? Do you have some place people can go? So we put that on the website. I'm like, I might as well put a few books on there. So now I've got you know, a few thousand books on there as well. And that just kind of snowballed and evolved. But eventually as, as the COVID thing wears down, I would like to start getting back out into these communities with the mobile store and start working with the schools and libraries in those areas. Oh, that's great. I, I can't imagine what my childhood would have been like if I wasn't reading comic books. You know, I, uh, I probably would have been extremely dull. <laughs> I'm not a big sports kid, so it was never, uh, if it didn't have an engine in it or it wasn't on a comic book page, I wasn't interested. So you were mentioning your charity work. What what got you, what got you started with your charity work? Um, well, the the two that I work mostly with. I mean, I work I work with other charities as well. We we've, we've done some stuff with Make a Wish and and a couple others. But two that I work mostly with: um, American Cancer Society. My wife is a two time cancer survivor, and I've lost an uncle to cancer my father's had cancer we lost my grandfather to cancer my sister-in-law's got it it's it's just a terrible thing that affects everybody in one way or another um and subsequently when we moved to utah three years ago like we've been working with american cancer society as volunteers for about 15 years but when we moved to utah three years ago my wife actually got a job working for them so that that just brought it full circle and and that's why I do work with American Cancer Society because their programs help not only fund research for for cancer and and helping to eliminate the disease itself but like the event that we're having this weekend the money from that goes to a wellness program called the Hope Lodge and the Hope Lodge is kind of a a really nice five-star hotel type situation where cancer patients get to live cost-free doesn't cost them a penny to live there while they're undergoing treatment here in salt lake 
Oh, wow. So they bring people from Montana and from Idaho and, and all over the Intermountain West, and they get to live there without the worry of having to, to pay for it while they're undergoing treatment um, at the U or at Huntsman or any of the great cancer centers that we have here in Utah. So that's where the money this weekend is going. The other charity I work with, Honor 365, they, they started out as a program that provides flights, free flights for veterans to go back to Washington, D.C. to see the memorials. So I've lost many friends on the battlefield. Being in the Special Forces, it's something that was really meaningful to me. And recently, uh, they've also started to work a lot helping Gold Star families and families of like fallen police officers and firemen and first responders. So I work a lot with them too. That's really great. Uh, I mean, thank you for your service, really, and and your charity work. I mean, I, I've always been about that stuff. I, I was also a first responder for a couple of years. It's a uh, takes its toll, but thank you, thank thank you for your service, really. Well, and I, I think that the two really go hand in hand. So yeah. you know, we we really as as comic book people, we spend our life looking up to heroes. And we learn how to be heroes from Spider-Man, from Captain America, you know, from Batman. We learn how to be a hero and step up to the task. And I don't know anybody that's into comics that isn't a charitable person. No. Stories like Spider-Man really, really got to me when it came to that. When I was younger, I, I used to work for the the Utah Food Bank and stuff like that and like volunteer for that and that's what led me towards trying firefighting and stuff like that. So I did that for about three years and uh, it was three of like the most amazing years of my life, but insanely crazy. I, I just think it's great that there are still people out there, you know, who read comic books and still attempt to be, you know, charitable. L let's talk uh, about the event for a second. So people know, all about the event. The event's at Black Cat Comics, right? Yes, it is. I, I always forget. I actually had to ask Greg because I was doing my, my YouTube videos this morning and I had to ask Greg what his address was up there. But yeah, it's Black Cat Comics, 2261 Highland Drive. And basically, uh, over the past year, Greg was lucky enough um, and, and smart enough in his business that he was able to expand. So he bought out the, the, the space next to him, broke down the wall and, and doubled his, his floor size in his store. So to go along with that and a grand reopening, we decided it would be, be the perfect time to have an event with Bleak Haven Comics because we had the exclusive that we did with them. And, and for people that are unfamiliar with that, an exclusive cover is when you approach a comic book company and, and you make a deal with them to have a special cover just for your store or your organization. And Bleak Haven, uh, the guys, Stanley, was nice enough to say, yeah, and give us a thumbs up and let us do an exclusive cover. Rufus knocked it out of the park on mine. Uh, I know Greg's really th thrilled with his, so we were able to incorporate that flip book format. Black Hat Comics has one cover, Rogue Trader has another, and we're gonna make these available at the event with a portion of the proceeds going to the charity. And we thought it'd be great to have the entire creative team from Bleak Haven come down to, to do some signings and, and autograph these books that they work so hard on. And that sounds great. I'll be there. It'll be sat this Saturday. March 13th. When Do you know when it starts? It starts at 11 o'clock and it, there's really no finish time. We're just going to keep going until we raised all the money we possibly can. Um, there's door prizes and um, some giveaways that we got. Got some really cool Xenoscope, uh, an indie comic company has sent us some stuff. The Hive guys have, have donated some stuff. I'm bringing some stuff in. Um, I know that, that there's a original piece of artwork that 
Stanley's going to bring down for the silent auction. And also, there's a, a, another exclusive. So, Leak Haven was our first exclusive cover. Mm -hmm. Well, there's another local Utah artist. Um, his name's Derek Draper, and he created a fantasy adventure called Harold's Journey. And he did an exclusive Rogue Trader Black Cat cover as well. And he's going to be there doing signings also. Oh, very, very, very cool. I don't think I asked you, how did you get involved with Bleak Haven? But, well, regardless, folks, check out the event on Saturday. Be there. It's going to be great. We're all going to be there. Yeah. How did you get involved with Bleak Haven Comics? Really, what it was is I, I just, the, the story resonated with me. When I, when I bought that book in, in Black Cat, the art is fantastic. Sure. Um, honestly, I and and I I'm hoping to have those guys on my uh, on my YouTube show so I can discuss with them, you know, influences and things like that because I see a lot of of other artists in in their type of work. So the art was really well done. There there's a technical way that you put together a comic book, and even if you look at the big three, Marvel, DC, and Image. In the, we've had discussions, me and my friends, where these books are not technically put together properly. So I don't know who did the, the layout and the formatting of Bleak Haven, did it in a way that was just right. And the book flows and the story's great. Characters are well thought out. And it's just, it gripped me. And I was, I was honestly, I read through it and I, I honestly was like, Greg's pulling my leg. These are not a bunch of kids from Utah putting this book together because it's really on par with anything that, that any of the top indie publishers are putting out right now. So it was, it was a no brainer to get behind them. And then I saw the flip book format and I'm like, that's super cool. I had been kicking around the idea of what I should do for my first exclusive. And I had looked at, at larger companies. I knew, Marvel, DC, and Image are out because you have to buy 5,000 copies of a book in order to work with them. So they were out for sure. Um, so I was looking at some of the others, um, Aftershock and Scout Comics do, are doing great things with smaller businesses like me. And, and I really was looking to get into something that was a little bigger than Bleak Haven. But when I saw it, really it's right on par with any of those companies that I just mentioned. And I'm like, these guys are local. There's no reason why I wouldn't get behind this as opposed to something else for my first album. And honestly, I would expect, and, and this is, you know, 30, 35 years of professional comics working with them. I would expect my exclusive to be worth, you know, five times what, what I've bought it for in another couple of years because I, I really see not just the comic books but the the way that they're taking Bleak Haven as more of a multimedia thing I, I really see it taking off and becoming a lot bigger than um, just a local published indie book and I, I personally I, I hope that's the case I hope it does I hope it takes off it's growing fast but I um, mean who knows what could happen within the next few years. I think it's going to be pretty great. What was it like working with Stanley and the Bleak Haven team? Uh, they've been awesome. I mean, I, I can't remember how I got a hold of him. I, I, I think it was an email. I, I sent him an email. And I'm like, I don't, I don't know if you even know how comic books work because I didn't know him from anybody. Um, but I, I want to do an exclusive. What could be the, what can we do to put this together? And he just uh, he immediately got right back with me. He's like, yeah, we can do this. We can do that. Our turnaround time on it was, I think we went from me picking up the book in Greg's store to having a finished book in my hand was probably about three weeks, which is completely unheard of. But yeah, they, they, every step of the way, they, they sent me the artist proofs. They wanted to make sure that my concept for my character the the rogue trader i mean they put him right on the cover which i wasn't expecting uh usually with a with an exclusive they just give you 
you know, they put your little logo down in the corner and, and do whatever they feel like doing. But they, they put my character right on the cover. They put Greg's logo as a piece of graffiti art prominent on the, on the first cover. So they've been really responsive to, and, and actually not even responsive, they've been proactive in making sure that our brand is represented, that our characters and our vision are represented. I kind of was teasing um, Stanley the other day about, you know, putting the character of the rogue trader in, in a shop in Bleak Haven and working with the next cover and stuff like that. And he's like, oh yeah, we'll do it. We'll do anything. We'll so extremely easy to work with and they've been fantastic. That's great. I think this weekend's event's going to be really great. You know, I hope people come out and check it out, but more or less, I hope Bleak Haven really takes off. And uh, I really appreciate you coming up on the podcast today. You bet. Thank you just to do a little plug uh where where can people find your website at the rogue trader website uh it's the rogue trader utah.com okay and on youtube where can they find you on there um there are links on my website and on my facebook page as well facebook.com the rogue trader utah is there anything else you'd like to add you'd like to tell the people at home um just you know come down meet meet the creators of bleak haven and when I don't mean the writers and artists, I mean, you get to meet every creator of the Bleak Haven world. They're all going to be there, even Cassandra. So come on down and check out what they have to offer. All right. Thanks a lot, Eric. I appreciate it. We'll, uh, we'll see you Saturday. All right.